segment of the Atos Nai project, and we're here with Gary Mason, who is the founder of the Scano Center, where we're conducting this interview, as well as the director of Rethinking Conflict. And Gary has worked in peace building all around the globe, and uh, we're very happy to have you as part of the series. Thank you. So, thank you. Well, Gary, um, as as I know, you've been working as a peace builder in different capacities uh, across Northern Ireland, but a lot of your work is taking you abroad. And so, can you tell us a little bit about what you? Been uh, what rethinking conflict is and what the work you've been undertaking. Okay. So rethinking conflict was set up about five six years ago. Uh, really, I guess spilling out of what, almost three decades of sort of on the ground peace building experience, really in that Northern Irish context. Uh, looking at a number of things from peace building, reconciliation, the role of religion in conflict, uh, toxic theology, etc., etc. And so some of the lessons that I have learned, which I hope are applicable to other spaces. So I spent probably six, seven months a year still in my own context. I think that's important, Andrew, in the sense that I think if I have any right to speak into another space, I think I still need to be doing stuff in my own space. I think it gives me that kind of authenticity mm -hmm. to talk into other spaces. So I mean, primarily my work is around Palestine-Israel conflict and doing work in the United States. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm still working extensively here in the Irish context. I mean, for the last almost four years since the joys of Brexit or not, I've been facilitating a lot of conversations between loyalist unionists and those in Dublin. Mm -hmm. I'm also involved with a group of other, uh, a couple of clergy, a couple of academics, really looking at the role of loyalism in the changing space. And I'm also involved in a project really looking at what are future relationships like in these islands. So really in the Irish context, those are the kind of three main concepts I'm involved in there. As regards the Middle East with all its complexity, we've had about a thousand Israelis and Palestinians in Belfast and also in Dublin in the last six, seven years. Mm -hmm. And of all shapes of opinion, so we were not just specifically doing center left or centrist or center right. Mm -hmm. I mean, we've had hard right in here from Israel, uh, as well as those on the left and in both contexts. Right. And I just think that's important, but I think one of the keys to our peace process you know, was bringing as many actors to the table as possible. Mm -hmm. And I mean, some of the lessons, I guess, so when people come here, it's not the Good Friday Agreement is the panacea for the Middle East, because it is not. But I think there are significant lessons from our peace process, which they tell me rather than me tell them. Mm -hmm. I can highlight those. First one is political leadership is essential to achieving peace. And I mean, anyone that looks at our space and studies our space, I mean, the role of people like, you know, the Bertie Ahearns, the Tony Blairs, the George Mitchells, but also people that took risks on different sides, from uh, Jerry Adams or Martin McGuinness, David Trimble or John Hume. So it just wasn't outside key leadership, mm -hmm. there was also internal key leadership as well. So I mean, within the Middle East, I will not pass judgment on who is leading either side at the moment, but political leadership is essential. Second thing that always comes to mind and this raised in the context is the role of security. I mean, as we we're talking today, as the Trump peace plan is being ruled out with all the conversations and bits and pieces about that, uh, globally and also in the Middle East. The concept of security is very much in there. So, I mean, from the Israeli mindset, they are saying whatever deal there eventually is, security is paramount from their perspective. And I understand that. I think one of the lessons people do learn here is we only got real security in this space when we dealt with the root causes of the conflict. Mm -hmm. You know, that's a very, very important lesson. Third thing is looking for the whole role of civic society. Really, to use our good friend John Brewer's phrase, the social peace process, mm -hmm. how does that work? It involves women's groups, academics, religious leaders, NGOs. And that also, I've often kind of described it, Andrew, even in the absence of Stormont in this space for almost, well, just three years until last month, really, civic society was the social glue that was holding this peace process together. Mm -hmm. So looking at the role of civic society. Also the futility of violence that eventually we realize, as I'm sure most Israelis and Palestinians realize, you know what, you guys can continue to kill each other for another 50 to 100 years. And we have exactly the same choice. Mm -hmm. um, so, but eventually people need to sit down and negotiate. 
and painfully work out the way forward. The last kind of lesson, and I often hear this from both Palestinians and Israelis, oh Gary, you don't understand. And I say, well, maybe I don't. We don't have a partner for peace. And I often say, and I look back to the sort of late 80s, early 90s, when a number of us were beginning those very uncomfortable conversations uh, with those in Sinn Féin, those within the IRA, those within loyalist groupings as well, I said, let me assure you, when we walked into the room for the first time, it was not hugs and kisses. I says, trust only evolved in the context of a meaningful relationship. Mm -hmm. And so I'm saying, I understand from both of us really had a Palestinian perspective that you don't think you have a partner, but until you begin to establish some human relationships, you're never gonna have a partner. Mm -hmm. And many, I think that's another key lesson. So they're saying that to me, rather than me saying, let me tell you what my guess is. With regards to the US, not getting into the Republican Democrat debate because like most people, like you as well, I have friends on both sides of this conversation. Yeah, yeah. You know, and invariably in the United States I may be staying with a Republican family for one week and then the next week you're staying with a, a Democratic family. I think one of the key things is, I remember I did a lecture in the States there not so long ago, looking at the whole concept of civil dialogue in uncivil times. Mm. So as opposed, I think, in the political space within the United States at the moment, how do people disagree well? I mean, John Sachs, the very well-known Jewish theologian, talks about linguistic balance, which is on the rise globally. And within the US, as I look at the US, as I look at the Middle East, as I look at Europe, as I look at Brexit, there is no question about it. The last four to five years has seen language used in political spaces that five to 10 years ago, people would have said, that was not a good way to speak. Mm -hmm. So really looking at that whole point of language, how do we disagree well, etc., etc., etc. Also looking at the American legacy. So how that spilled out, it's a theologian in the Union Theological Seminar up on Upper West Side there in Manhattan. A few years ago wrote this article, as he said, no one in the United States wants to deal with a legacy of slavery. So I was kind of responding to him and pulled it out and said, hmm, there's a really interesting S word, i.e. the word slavery. But let me tell you about mine. It's another S word, it's called sectarianism. And I think one of the lessons I think from this space is because we have the courage to deal with our legacy, we ended up with a pretty messy civil war. So I think there's something about political leadership in the US, about religious leadership, and about academic leadership that needs to have the courage to deal with the legacy. I know often sort of different older clergy would have said to me, well, Gary, you know, in the 1950s and in the 1960s, our churches were full. I said, well, they may have been full, but as people providing what I would like to call prophetic religious leadership in the public space, you weren't really doing that. Mm -hmm. Primarily because your gift to my generation was actually a very, very bloody sectarian war because you didn't have the courage to deal with this legacy. So I just think within the US, it's so important to deal with the past mm -hmm. and to not let it haunt you. I suppose the other piece of work I'm doing in a number of different spaces is the role of memory. I mean, David Reith, the New York journalist, probably read his book called In Praise of Forgetting. But he also did an article for The Guardian where he talks about the cult of memory when history does more harm than good. And how do we do history in contested spaces? Mm -hmm. I don't think we do history very well here. We, we use it primarily as a kind of brickbat for the other. So, he plays with these two phrases, and you know, he's not talking about shameful amnesia, but he uses this phrase as kind of juxtaposition, the terror of remembering versus the terror of forgetting. So as we sit here in Skynos, across the street, there are many wall paintings that Belfast is renowned for, and basically we're sitting in a very loyalist unionist area, and the mural there depicts on kind of front uh, headline newspaper pages, uh, atrocities the other, the other being the IRA, the Catholic Republican community have done on us. Uh, we never appeal to this side of the fence what we've done on them. But the strap line above it says, the price of peace is eternal vigilance. It almost seems like a kind of nice phrase, but it's really subtext for always keep an eye on the other side. You really can't trust it. You're an ordained uh, minister yourself and you touch a little bit on the, the role of uh, faith and peace building. So that's, that's my question. What is the role 
of faith and peace building, particularly in the grassroots? May I offer you two positions there, and they're kind of say pastoral in conjunction with prophetic. I would say most churches in the Irish space, by and large, have done a pretty good job pastorally. Baptisms, funerals, marriage counseling, bereavement counseling, etc., etc., etc. I still would want to say I think the church could have done a hell of a lot better in relation to what I would call prophetic ministry in the public space. So I think we have many clergy in this space who, to my mind, were simply chaplains to their own tribes. Mm -hmm. There was no engaging with some of the real issues, and I know there was a multiplicity of reasons around that. Uh, John Brewer, who we alluded to there earlier, BBC did a documentary there, I think it was September 2018, I'm guessing, on myself and a couple of other clergy. And John is very honest, frank way said, a number of these clergy persons were just simply mavericks. And I think what he was really saying was they weren't always necessarily acting with the approval of the institution. Mm -hmm. uh, I can probably say this now, probably could be said there's a younger clergy person, uh, but many churches are just institutionalized spaces that want to preserve the institution rather than actually deal with what is going on in the public space. Mm -hmm. So I think sometimes churches at times can be some of the most dishonest spaces on the planet where despite what is going on inside, you come to this space and you ignore the world around you. I mean, one of the design things in the Skenos building, and I have no architectural skill at all, but one of the things I know was built into it was that there were lots of windows and the logic being even when you're inside a church building, you need to keep one eye on the outside. And I think in so many of our kind of church spaces, that was not happening. I think a number of clergy people uh, just did not want to take risk because they wanted to preserve the institution. Uh, I'm not sure that very uh, disturbing religious figure, Jesus Christ of the first century, uh, really would have set well in some of our so-called institutional spaces that we have at the moment. So I think there's something about the churches being honest and when something goes wrong, having the courage to say that. Mm -hmm. You know, I often see people posting bits and pieces about dealing with injustice, knowing that the space in which they're functioning, they're actually ignoring injustice mm -hmm. in a sense. So there's something about ministry in the public space. I mean, I think Methodist theology, if people do it right, allows that. I mean, John Stott, the former, uh, well, he's now deceased, he died in 92, the evangelical Anglican, kind of described Methodist theology like a bird with two wings. There's sort of social holiness and personal holiness. And if you cut off a wing of a bird, invariably it collapses. And I really think most Methodist churches are not really engaging in what I would call social holiness. There's an institutional preservation mentality let's maintain the institution and really in the public space and I want to ask how much difference the church is actually making and I'm not talking about the church dominating society because I don't think religion ever should dominate society but if you look at Amos who's called a minor prophet for some bizarre reason by a number of theologians Amos was on the margins of society speaking into the world of the Israelite of that day mm. and really critiquing them very very so I don't think the churches have really owned up to the kind of sectarian culture they create in the space. I mean, if you look globally, I always say that I'm lecturing, slavery and sectarianism, those two twin evils, evolved around the same time, mm. 16th, 17th century. Um, and there's no question about it. South Africa, another classic example, where the Dutch Reformed Church very cleverly developed a very elaborate theological system to prop up apartheid as well. So I think sometimes the first agenda for the church, to me, in the Northern Irish space, should actually be repentance. Because I don't think we've been very good at saying that we did create a space or shape a space that really allowed things to ferment. And it, I mean, Cecil Clare, the late Cecil Clare, the uh, sort of Anglican charismatic one said, most people in our churches did not have guns in their hands, but they most certainly had them in their you know, so I think this place was a space, despite what was said, that we were kind of theologically assassinating the other. Now, I have no difficulty with theological disagreement, 
It's the way we do disagreement. Mm -hmm. So I think a lot of disagreement in the church was done quite deceitfully. There wasn't an honest, open dialogue around some of those theological differences. And I think if we're all honest, you know, I mean, theology can be absolutely toxic. I mean, theology can allow people to take off the gun. There's no question about that. I mean, I often look at the history of, you know, what we call uh, anti-Semitism, which really began as religious anti-Semitism. I mean, the Jewish theologian writing in this said, you know, let's be honest. The first ghettos were created by the Christian church. It was not the Nazis. With basically the phrase, you Jews have no right to live among us. So the secular rulers come along then and say, you Jews have no right, plural, to live among us. Hitler comes along and says, you Jews have no right to live. So Hitler wasn't discarding the past. He was actually building on the past. And I think in our context, while this was never a religious war, I think many people cleverly built on the toxic sectarian theology, which this place was ripe with for years and used it to demonize the other. So again, to quote another Jewish theologian, where he says, dehumanization precedes genocide. So I think theologically we were dehumanizing each other as lesser, as not as true to the word of God as the other, etc., etc., etc. And I think I would agree with John Brewer when he says, by and large, the institutional church within this space uh, could have done a hell of a lot better as regards peacemaking. They work in the assumption that giving out a pamphlet on a Sunday morning as the congregation is leaving worship, this is our response to whatever, that that is going to work. Mm -hmm. Actually it doesn't, because most people probably don't read them. They go home and they leave them. It's, it's prophetic, tangible action in the public square makes a difference. Not hiding behind uh, institutional niceties uh, that does make a difference. I think another classic example is that, I mean, to look at the United States, uh, a blogger there, a woman theologian by the name of Hackett was uh, talking about um, promise keepers, which as you remember was the movement by white evangelicals in the US to bring about reconciliation. And the idea was to pack whites and blacks into baseball stadiums or American football stadiums, play some nice charismatic music, uh, which really would lift the person's emotions a white man was encouraged, go hug a black man. And that was classed as racial reconciliation. And I think the churches here were guilty of that as well. We, and I'm not against ecumenical services. But we worked on the assumption if we could get a group of Catholics and Protestants into St. Peter's or St. Alan's Cathedral and hold hands and sing Kumbaya, all will be well. And outside, there was a bloody civil war going on, mm. which was caused by a number of issues in this space, which we never really dealt with. So I think sometimes the church is into superficial answers rather than what I would call hard, meaningful engagement, which I think the church should be about. So Gary, if you can tell us a little bit of the history of the Skano Center, which yeah. we're now sitting in, and the ethos behind the project and some of the services it provides to the community. I mean, bizarrely, uh, we already tell this story, the vision for Skanos was born when uh, I had a lot less uh, wrinkles and a lot more hair way back in the autumn of 1991 when inside a kind of two to three month block I spent three weeks in South Africa and uh, I was doing some uh, facilitation uh, with some black communities a thing called the Group Building Encounter and during that time I was taken to see a project called The Dock which was really a disused railroad station on the docks of Durban and had a multiplicity of different ministries in a space that was painfully coming out of apartheid. It stuck with me as a very young clergy person. A month later, I ended up in Atlanta, Georgia. There I met a person called Bob Lupton, whom I still keep in touch with. And Bob was doing what was mixed income housing. So Grant Park in Atlanta then, filled with pimps, prostitutes, drug dealers, the place was a mess. And basically what he did was this thing called gentrification with justice. So Bob argued, look, spaces are going to be gentrified, we can't stop economics. But if it is going to happen, how do we do gentrification with justice? What does that look like? Mm -hmm. And so as we sit here in the Skanos project today, there are, in the space, 35 apartments, 150 people living on site, 
And the temptation could have been in building the apartments in the Skanos building. Well, let's put all the young professionals on one side, mm -hmm. the uppies, those with doctorates and masters, as they walk into the city centre, which is 15 minutes walk away. And let's put all the single parents and the poor people on the other side. But we didn't do that. So this project has mixed income housing. So you could have an architect living next door to a single parent, etc., etc., etc. So really, Skanos was born out of that, really creating a space uh, that was born theologically. I mean, the key verse, I suppose, biblically in all this was from John 1 and verse 14 that says, and Jesus moved into our neighborhood and pitched his tent among us. Tent is skenos, the Greek word for tent. And also we decided not to call spaces in the building, at least during my time, others may see it different, we decided not to call the place after a dead Methodist, which invariably we do do in churches a lot. Mm -hmm. So we try to give a community character by calling it after the streets in the area, giving the history of the area, to allow local people to take ownership of the space as well. I mean, churches are very protective of their space. I remember after before spring when I, I gave a Catholic Dominican sister the keys of the building, uh, many of my uh, Protestant friends went mad. And it was only a reflection I realized Keys symbolize ownership, mm -hmm. in a sense. So I wanted the community to have ownership of this space because it was built for them, not for the church. I mean, we often say, this building is open to the glory of God, and invariably it's open to the glory of the person. So the whole idea was to kind of, you know, minimize the over-churchiness of the space and allow people to feel ownership of it, but to make a live theology within this building. To my mind, anyway. Others watching are happy to disagree. I don't mind. <laughs> Fantastic uh, stuff, Gary, and uh, obviously an amazing career that's taken you all around the world, and you've given so much back to the community here in Northern Ireland and abroad. So I want to thank you. Well, thank you. Yeah. Best wishes what you're doing as well. Absolutely. <laughs> this is another segment of the Atos Nine project, and we look forward to seeing you out in the community soon.